Good afternoon, Pittsburgh Steelers fans, and welcome to another episode of Steelers Brunch with Tony, and I am your host, Tony Defio. And thank you, as always, for joining me on this fine Saturday afternoon, at least where I am in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just 10 minutes outside of Heinz Field. You're jealous. Anyway, don't worry, there's nobody there right now. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, before I begin, I wanted to encourage you, as always, to subscribe and like our YouTube channel where we have uh at least one podcast every single day there's the stat geek hosted by btsc editor dave schofield and his brother big bro Sco. i actually heard his name the other night but i i forget it already sorry but that's a great show and of course steelers preview with uh brian anthony davis and michael beck i think dave is in there sometimes uh there's what am I missing? There's uh, the standard is the standard, which is our our, our flagship podcast. Uh, there's yeah, I said it, hosted by the the legendary Lance Williams every Friday. His show last night was pretty was, was really good. Uh, and of course, uh, Steelers Q and A, hosted by yours truly and Brian Anthony Davis every Monday at five o'clock. That's in the off season and in the regular season. It's called Steelers Hangover, where we discuss the previous day's Steelers game. Uh, and then of course. Uh, I don't know how this is happening. Maybe it's Michael Beck, the great Michael Beck, the new behind the steel curtain deputy editor. But we're lining up a lot of really good interviews. Uh, I watched the one with Zach Banner, Steelers tackle Zach Banner, uh, that he 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 joined Brian and and Dave and Michael uh, Friday afternoon. It was a really great interview. Dave uh, uh, Zach Banner is just a, an amazing personality. And 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 if you have if you get a chance, please uh, check that. Uh, Check that interview out. He he offers a lot of great insight on the um, on on what he hopes to achieve this year at uh at, at right tackle. So please check that out. And as always, check out behind the steel curtain, the website where we bring you ten articles each and every day. There's news, breaking news, regular old news. There's commentary. There's film breakdown. There's salary cap articles. There's articles about anything you want. As we as we like to say, it's your one shop, uh, one stop shop for all your Steelers needs. So please check that out. So uh, wanted to say hi to everybody. There's uh, Steelers Pittsburgh. That's a, it's a new name. Jared Devil, how you doing? Nathaniel, Logan, my man Logan, Logan DiLorenzo. great guy. Thank you for thank you everybody for joining me. And as always, I want I want to cover uh, uh, a few topics on today's show and I, and I want to apologize for last week how my show ended with the uh technical difficulties i had i don't know what was going on i had uh, internet issues off and on for a number of days and actually affected uh my saturday podcast and then it almost affected my ability to go on the air with brian on monday so it was really a problem for a number of days but uh we seem to have that cleared up so again i apologize but i'll try to cover up cover some of those uh, topics I wanted to talk about last week at the end of the show. But what I want to talk about today, I want to start off with uh, an announcement that Mike Tomlin made, head coach Mike Tomlin made on Tuesday when he was talking to the media. He mentioned that that Matt Filer would be starting the training camp at left guard and Shuk Sikorfor and Zach Banner would be competing at right tackle for the right tackle spot, which I thought was kind of interesting. You know, being a pragmatic kind of guy, uh, a practical kind of guy, I just assumed that they wouldn't want to disrupt two different positions along the line. You know, following the the retirement of of Ramon Foster, the great Ramon Foster, after 11 years, they uh, they were going to need to find a a new starting left guard. But I just assumed with the the signing of Stefan Wisniewski, the veteran that they signed from the Chiefs back in March, that he they, they could just throw him in there for the time being. And hopefully develop Kevin Dotson, the fourth round pick in this past year's draft. Uh, maybe by the end of the year, but maybe by next year, and he would be your your starting left guard moving forward. Uh, but when you really think about it, it's they're not really disrupting two different positions along the line because Matt Filer has experience at guard. I think that's where he began his career with the Steelers as a guard before moving to tackle uh, once uh, Marcus Gilbert had his problems his last couple of years here with injuries. I think he was suspended for a few games for PEDs, but at any rate, uh, so he has experience there and, and he actually played there last year 
in the game against the Rams because Tomlin wanted uh, bigger bodies in the middle to to deal with the likes of Aaron Donald in that massive and very accomplished front seven that the Rams have. So uh, he does have experience there. So if you throw him over there and uh, left guard, at least to start the year, at least to start training camp, then I think there's a, there's a certain comfort level there, right? You're not going to really compromise that position by putting a, a guy like Matt Filer there, who's started a number of games at right tackle and has done really well. So he's a really talented and versatile lineman. And when it comes to Shooks Accor for a third round pick from Western Michigan in 2018 and Zach Banner, who came to Pittsburgh in 2018, I think, yeah, 2018 uh, via the Browns. And before that, he was he was the uh, Colts fourth round pick out of USC in 2017. Uh, you know, you have to find out about these guys. I'm pretty sure they want to find out about these youngsters. Uh, you know, Shooks is coming in his third year. He's a third round pick again. And. Those, those, you know, you don't draft a guy in the third round in any position, except for maybe backup quarterback, if you don't want him to start sooner rather than later, you know. Uh, and, and of course, Zach Banner, he's he he's uh, put in a lot of great work to get down. He said in his interview on Friday that he was up to 420, and you know he put in the work. Now he's down to 340. So, uh, you know, it's about time that they find out about these guys and. And uh, and if you could if you could find a starter out of those two uh, youngsters, then you know you'll be okay at at, at at that position for for a year or so. And then who knows? You know, Big Al Al, Al Villanueva. I mean, he's a great guy. He's a very popular player with the fans. But you know, he'll be 32 years old by the time the season starts, and he also has a pretty decent contract. So you know, uh, in, in a football sense, he's, he's fairly young. But in a professional athlete sense, he's getting up there. So um, maybe the, maybe you find two starters, somebody that can replace Big Al, maybe not this year or even next year, maybe, maybe in a few years. Uh, maybe Shooks is your starting left tackle and Zach Banner is your starting right tackle and Matt Filer is your starting left guard. Or maybe maybe Kevin Dotson is your starting left guard and, and Matt Filer is uh, uh, somewhere else because you know he'll be a – a 10 year vet by then and, and he'll be around 30 years old. So, I mean, the lion's getting, getting up there in age and, 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 and you're going to want to find, uh, find out about some of these young guys. And, and, and it's not just, not just Zach Banner and, 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 and Shooks, but what about Derwin Gray? Here's a guy that, that they drafted in the seventh round out of Maryland in the 2019 NFL draft. You know, uh, one of the things that Mike Munchak, the great Mike Munchak was known for, here was not just developing the the high pedigreed players, but developing the the youngster the, the the undrafted free agents and uh, guys that you'd expect to, to have careers. Guys like Chris Hubbard, guys like Matt Filer, who was an undrafted free agent. B.J. Finney, undrafted free agent. I mean, he developed these guys into really good offensive linemen. So, you know, uh, one thing that that I was impressed with uh, Zach Banner that he said during the interview with with uh, with with Dave and the guys yesterday was that. Some of the techniques that 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 has that have made him a better uh, tackle, he learned since coming to Pittsburgh. I think that speaks a lot, not just for Mike Munchak, but to Sean Surrett, who uh, was Munchak's understudy for a number of years before finally uh, getting the job as offensive line coach when Munchak moved to Denver last year. So I think that says a lot. So you know, uh, it's going to be interesting interesting to see where these guys are as far as. You know, your Zach Banners, your Shooks, uh, Derwin Gray, where they are in their development, you know. And, and as I already said, guys like uh, Banner and, and, and Okorfor, they sh- they should, they're at the point where they, they should be ready to start. You know, if they're, if they're going to start, this is the point of their careers where they should be, be able to win starting jobs, you know. Um, uh, and, and if that's the case, if it works out that way this year, then, you know, with, with a guy like Wisniewski, uh, I think it's ideal, it would be ideal for him to be your, your versatile and, interior backup li- offensive lineman. He, he could play center. He could play either guard position. I think that would be an ideal thing for the Steelers in 2020. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how that, how that plays out. Uh, once training camp starts, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully uh, I think they're supposed to report on July 22nd, maybe the 26th. I'm not exactly sure, but hopefully uh, training camp does kick off in, in a little under a month and, and we'll get to see how that competition, how that whole thing all plays out. So, 
that's my first topic I wanted to discuss. And sorry, I got to look at my notes here. Uh, and I'm sorry, if, if you guys are asking questions, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get to them in a bit. I'm still learning the whole live chat and segment part of the, of the podcast. But let's see here. Okay. Another thing that, that Mike Tomlin announced on Tuesday in this uh, virtual press conference with the media was that two Steeler players, two unknown Steeler players, tested positive for the COVID-19 virus back in the spring. He didn't say when, but sometime back in the spring. And uh, when I first heard that, I kind of, I paused. I said, hmm, I wonder if it's going to be big news or not. You know, because sometimes I just wait for the reaction of the media and the public to determine whether or not something's big news. And surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, it wasn't that big, big of a deal. I mean, it was, I mean, it's obviously a big deal. This is, this is a very serious virus. But, it, it, you know, if this would have been in March when this was announced, I think it would have been a much more dramatic uh, reaction. You know, but now that we're a few months into this thing and we see that so many athletes have contracted this, or have tested positive for this virus. And as far as I can tell, they're all recovered. I mean, we don't, we still don't know about the long-term effects. I mean, somebody, I read an article about it the other day and somebody called me out in the, in the comment section saying it was irresponsible. But I guess my point that I was trying to make is as far as the NFL conducting its business and not just, oh my God, two, two players tested positive, or this player tested positive, that play, we have to shut everything down. You know, I think had the, and, and that's where the NFL being granted the gift of time came in handy or, or is coming in handy because, um, we, you know, we've seen how various leagues have reacted to their players testing positive. And in the beginning, again, everything was shut down. Uh, but, you know, athletes in the NBA and the NHL and the NFL and baseball, they, they've been testing positive and the leagues have moved ahead with their preparations. And, and you know, they're still expected to start like the NHL, the NBA and, and Major League Baseball. They're all expected to resume sometime in July, or by the end of July, anyway, or early August. So uh, now that we have protocols in place and, and, and you know, there, all these facilities have been uh, re refurbished, so to speak, for and, 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 and brought up to code for, for the COVID-19 and for social distancing. And, 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 and again, there are protocols in place with how to handle things when an athlete test positive you know they obviously they go into quarantine and they're away from the the uh the rest of the team and and i'm, I'm sure the, the same would, would 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 apply to a coach or a trainer or anybody who works for a team would have to be removed from the facilities and away from the team until they are recovered so uh i think that bodes well for for the 2020 season in terms of of what would happen. I mean, again, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, if Big Ben, you know, if we're in, if we're in week four and Ben Roethlisberger tests positive for COVID nineteen and has to miss a couple of weeks, that's going to be a very big deal. But I don't think they're going to shut down the league because of it. Because uh, first of all, there's not there, there probably aren't going to be fans in the stands. So you're, you're not going to have you're not going to have like a, a, a whole stadium full of people uh, that are going to you know to try to have to worry about it. It's just try to contain it as much as you can with the, the, the players on both teams and, and the staffs of both teams. So, you know, as of right now, it doesn't look like it's going to uh, shut down the season if a player comes down with this test pot, which is it's almost inevitable at this point, right? I mean, it's almost inevitable that that somebody on each team probably is going to catch this. It's going to come down with this virus and have to be quarantined and have to be put on – IR, so to speak, right? So, um, as of right now, though, I, I don't think it's 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 it doesn't look like it's gonna shut things down unless there's like a, a mass outbreak, you know, with with one team or several teams, right? So, I just think it was a uh, it was very good news that that two Steelers tested positive and it didn't again it didn't shut down the season and and they're recovered and. And I'm assuming that they're going to be allowed to do it, join the rest of the team for training camp. So that's pretty much all I want to say about that. And uh, I want to move on to my third topic, which is Jamal Adams. And I realize this might be a bit of old news, but I always think it's fascinating 
when a a a, a player either becomes available because of because he was released or is a free agent or is disgruntled and 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 wants to trade and and Jamal Adams the safety the all pro safety for the Jets he falls into that last category he's he's disgruntled in New York and he wants traded he's demanded a trade he's been vocal about it and and um naturally since the Steelers have been pretty aggressive in over the last few years they they signed Joe Hayden in 2017 they quickly signed him after the Browns cut him at the end of training camp they uh they traded up last year to to draft Devin Bush when you know obviously that was the only way they were going to address their very glaring needed inside linebacker they traded up and, and they traded uh, a number of draft picks away to get him and of course last year when Micah Fitzpatrick who was disgruntled in Miami uh when he when he wanted a trade they they were aggressive and they traded their 2020 first round pick to the Dolphins for his services and obviously it worked out really well so with all that as a backdrop it makes perfect sense that people we're wondering if the Steelers should do that again and be aggressive and trade a first, second, whatever, pick to the Jets for Jamal Adams. And yeah, I mean, it would be nice. I mean, people say, would you like to have the, the best safety tandem in the NFL? Of course, of course, it would be great. I'd also love to have, you know, Aaron Donald in the middle of that, um, of that <laughs> defensive line to take the place of Javon Hargrave, theoretically. You know, I'd like to have a lot of things, right? But, you know, um, his, the, the reason why Jamal Adams wants out of New York, maybe he doesn't like Adam Gase, and I guess who can blame him for that? He doesn't seem to ha- be a very popular personality. But, uh, his biggest reason for wanting out of New York is financial. You know, he wants a new deal. I mean, he's in his third year, I think, 2017, 18, 19. Yeah, he's heading into his fourth year. And he wants a, he's an all pro, as I mentioned. So he wants a rookie, he wants a new deal to that reflects his play on the field before his rookie deals even even done. So him leaving New York to come to Pittsburgh is not going to change that. He's not going to suddenly say, oh, okay, I'm in Pittsburgh now. All I care about is winning the Super Bowl. I don't care about money anymore. You know, that's how that's not how most athletes think. That's not how I would think. I know that. I mean, if you gave me a choice between employee of the month or a, a substantial raise, I'm going to I'm going to want the raise, right? So him coming here is not going to change the fact that he wants paid a substantial amount of money him going anywhere is not going to change that no matter where he goes he's his problem still going to persist and that's that he wants paid so uh with that in mind uh, is that what the Steelers want you know do they want a potential uh locker room problem you know do they want somebody who's going to be speaking up to the media saying i want paid do they want somebody do they want to pay somebody that you know yeah they know he's a great player it's pretty obvious he's a great player but they don't have a relationship with him. They didn't bring him into the league. They didn't uh, bring him along. They didn't develop him, right? Are they going to want to pay him, bring him in immediately, and pay him, you know, a boatload of money uh, when they when they're still going to want to want to have? They're still going to have to pay Minka Fitzpatrick in a couple of years, uh, T.J. Watt <laughs> uh, in a couple of years, um, maybe Bud Dupree. Uh, they have to make a decision on Juju. I mean, there, there are a lot of financial decisions they have to make and uh, to bring a new guy in here and and immediately pay him what he wants i just don't see that happening you know so um never say never i mean i've learned learned that with the steelers over the last few years as i as i alluded to earlier but i just don't i just don't see it you know and, and he's not he's not on their list anyway or they're not on his list i should say as far as uh teams that he supposedly once traded to so i i don't know if 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 he would come here, if he would even be happy anyway. So that's the third thing I wanted to touch on. And uh, I, 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 I think it's an interesting topic, right? I mean, you know, how many players have been linked to the Steelers so far this off season, Leonard Fournette, uh, obviously Jameis Winston, even JJ Watt for uh, maybe not seriously, but people were clamoring for JJ Watt to come here after they signed Derek Watt and obviously Cam Newton uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting a few players. So uh, it, it's nice to say, you know, it's nice to talk about, but it's probably not realistic. Uh, not in this case, because there's a difference between why Minka was angry in Miami. He was angry because they were tanking it. I mean, they were just, 
they wanted to build a team around him, or so they said, but they were also uh, not interested in winning. Whereas Jamal Adams, he just wants to be paid, and that's a whole different kind of disgruntled. So that's again, that's my uh, those are my thoughts on that, and I just want to take a uh, my usual twenty minute uh, tr- refreshment break. Excuse me. As far as you know, it's only Diet Pepsi. If we go through a whole season without football, that might change. I might go all Bob Euchre and Major League, but not yet. It's just plain old Diet Pepsi, so don't worry about that. So let's see what else I want to talk about here. And my last topic that I really wanted to cover, ah, yes, is the fact that the Hall of Fame game was canceled. After much speculation, you know, Steelers and the Cowboys were supposed to kick off on kick off the football season on August 6th in Canton, Ohio, with the annual Hall of Fame game. But unfortunately, it was canceled the other day, along with the Hall of Fame ceremonies, and they both been pushed back to 2021. And that's unfortunate, but I get it, right? You know, uh, Ohio still dealing with uh, with the COVID-19. Their, their their cases are still rising, so. Uh, it makes sense not to to have this game right now. And a lot of people think that's a bad omen for the start of the NFL season or for having an NFL season at all. And at this moment, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think that's the the case. Because, first of all, I think the Hall of Fame game, more than any other preseason game, is for the fans, right? So what's the point of having uh, this Hall of Fame game if there's nobody in the stands to watch it, right? What's the point of having a Hall of Fame ceremony, and all these induction speeches, if there are no fans in, I don't know what they have, it, in, in, uh, on the lawn or whatever, however the, uh, the Hall of Fame ceremony is set up, however the, that thing's set up, what's the point of having it without fans present, right? You can have regular preseason games without fans because it's really a, about, you know, uh, evaluating players, right? And getting, play, and the veterans getting their timing, all, that whole Sort of, you know, you really don't need fans for that. But for the Hall of Fame game, not to have fans, it just it seems pointless to play the game, I guess. You know, and and I and I don't think that's a true barometer anyway for for how things might go as far as starting the regular season in September. I think if you want a better barometer, look at how the NA, look what happens with the NHL, look what happens with Major League Baseball, look what happens with the NBA. Right, these three leagues have been planning for months on restarting their twenty. 19, 2020 campaigns, right? In the case of the NBA and the NHL, 2019, 2020. In the ca- case of Major League Baseball, their 2020 season. They've been planning for months on how to do this. So if they decide, and, and as I mentioned earlier, they're all expected to start in July or by the end of July. So if we get to that point and they just say, and they decide, like, well, I don't think it's safe to play. I don't think it's, even, even without fans in the stands, I don't think it's safe to play. I don't think it's, play, I think we just, just cancel all these seasons and, and wait till 2021, then I think you might have to start worrying about the NFL and its season, right? Because why should the NFL be any different, even without fans in the stands? I mean, if there's ever a, a, a sport where you can't really practice social distancing, it's football, right? So if these other three sports have to cancel or if they, if they deem it too unsafe or not safe enough to, to resume or to play, then I think the NFL would have to follow suit, you know? So... Those are the leagues to watch, right? Not the, the fact that they canceled the Hall of Fame game. I think it's 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 will baseball actually play? I mean, we've been taught, we've been hearing and hearing, we've been hearing so much about these protocols that the NHL and, and baseball and the NBA have been discussing and have have put in place. All right, fine. Now let's see you play the games and let's see what happens, right? So I think those are the le- again, those are the leagues to watch. And wow, here we are at the 24-minute mark, and I, I, I've already uh, gone through all of my uh, my weekly topics. So uh, either I've talked too fast, which if you think I I do, I don't blame you, or I just you know I, I'm becoming more efficient. I don't know, but I'm glad I'm glad we're through all that because I want to I want to finish up on what I was talking about last week with uh, with my trip down memory lane as, as it evolves the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I think where I, where I left off is right before Super Bowl 40. And I'm not going to go through all like, like had I, like I planned on last week going through everything step by step. I just want to talk about one 
really specific era uh, part of the the Super Bowl forty run, and that was attending the Joey Porter show every every Tuesday night during that eight week uh, stretch where they they never lost. They, they won eight, eight games in a row, and and uh, I don't know if you if you remember the Joey Porter show, and maybe you know I think it was only around for a couple of years. I think it was oh four and oh five. It was definitely oh five because that's when I attended, but. It was uh, it was taped every Tuesday night at the Firehouse Lounge in the Strip District in Pittsburgh, and it aired I think every Friday or Saturday on this little independent station uh, called WBGN, which I don't think is around anymore. It's actually it, it it's right out of uh, Green Tree, right up the road. So, but I don't think it's actually a thing anymore. But it was back then, and uh, it was hosted by Joey Porter, and his co-host was Chris Hope. The the uh the safe the, the the safety at the time uh Troy's uh Troy's Robin right you know he he did a good job here uh basically backing up Troy and his freelancing so Chris Hope was the uh the co-host and John Burton who was a uh at the time a, a local uh broadcaster for WTAE sports broadcaster he was he acted sort of like the quarterback he kind of kept things moving uh for the show and and uh, PZ had had he, they talked about the previous week's game um and he had guests he had a Steeler guest every week it was pretty it was pretty cool that he would you know because they were all his teammates so naturally they're not going to say no to him so he had uh Jerome was on Antoine Randall Big Ben was there Alan Fanica Aaron Smith I think was there Big Big Hamp Casey Hampton it was just a really fun time and I actually started going my first night there in attendance was right after they beat the the Bears that famous game where where the bus ran over Brian Erlacher that game. The week before, my aunt called me after they lost to the Bengals. They dropped the seven and five. She called me right as the show was was starting and said, "You know, you need to come down and see this." I'm like, oh, I don't feel like it. They suck. I don't. I don't care about the Joey Porter show. I don't want to go. So I didn't go. You know. But the following week, I, I suddenly had Steeler fever again because they won, and their playoff prospects looked a lot better. Like they went into that week against the Bears. Not only out of the playoff race, but really, out. I mean, they needed a lot of help just to get back in the playoff race. With a month to go, that's how far out they were at that point. But things started falling in place for, into place for them, starting against the Bears. So I start, I attended, and it was fun. And there weren't that many people there, and the, you know the enthusiasm wasn't that that great. But Randall L was actually the uh, the guest star, and. The thing that I found funny about what he had to say that night was that he really, really wanted to play quarterback. I mean, he wasn't like uh, like being humble and saying, oh, I like playing receiver. He was like, I, I want to be the quarterback. You know, I mean, he, you know, I don't, he didn't really get that deep into it. He didn't say he wanted to take Ben's place, but he said if he had the choice uh, that he would actually rather be a quarterback than a receiver. I mean, he was a quarterback in Indiana and he, he was like a jack of all trades kind of quarterback but that, that was really his passion was to play quarterback and then when it came to sports in general his bigger passion was baseball like if he had a choice between baseball and football he'd have rather played baseball and actually he came out and said that after everything started happening with concussions about 10 years ago he he uh he was quoted as saying he, you know if he had to do it all over again he would try to play baseball rather than football you know so i guess that was his first love so but anyway, um, with each passing week, as they as they continued to win, uh, the crowds at this uh, at the Joey Porter show they they grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, by the end, when they after they the last show that they filmed in Pittsburgh was uh, after they obviously beat Denver in the AFC Championship game, and and it was kind of like a tribute to Jerome Bettis. Um, they had all the stars were there: Heinz Ward, Deshae Townsend, everybody was there. Casey Hampton. He walked by me. I patted him on the back. I was like, it was like patting it was like putting my hand on the pillow that's how much girth was there no offense to him i mean he was a borderline uh hall of fame nose tackle so he had to have girth especially in the steelers 3-4 defense at the time but um it was a really it was a really fun night and it's one it's it was definitely my favorite of all the shows and naturally they had just clinched a trip to the super bowl so i was i was riding pretty high there but my favorite story, which I haven't told all that much because I, you know, it involves me in the bathroom, is I was in the bathroom and uh, taking care of business. And this big dude came in. I don't know if he was a bouncer for the firehouse lounge or if he was 
in Jerome's entourage. He was his uh, bodyguard. But he said, hey, have you seen my man's phone? I said, who? Whose phone? Jerome's. I said, no, I, I haven't seen it. So I wonder if, to, if this, to this day, I wonder if they thought I found Jerome's phone in the bathroom and took it. But of course, I, I didn't. And I wonder what was on that phone. Well, I guess we'll never know. I hope, hopefully, for his sake, he got it back that night. I don't know. But it was, it was a very fun time. And they, they, they did one more show after that. And that was on location in Detroit. And then the Joey Porter show was never seen again. But, you know, if you, have, if you can find it on YouTube, which I can't, but if you ever get a chance to see it on YouTube, hopefully maybe somebody will, maybe somebody has a, a tape in their possession of that show and they can upload it on YouTube. Um, check it out. It was a lot of fun. And it's one of those uh, times in my life that as a sports fan, I'll, I'll never forget. I really, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, they say sports are for kids and I was 33 years old at that time. And I felt like a little kid, you know, it was just a magical uh, time, time to be a Steelers fan. Naturally they won the Super Bowl the first time in a quarter of a century. So that frames my memory, you know, my, my perception of that time, right. You know, had they lost in the Super Bowl, had they lost in the playoffs, maybe I don't remember it as fondly, but it was, it was just a lot of fun. And, and it just goes to show you that even when you're in your thirties or forties or fifties, when a team goes on a, on a championship run, you kind of it kind of brings you back to the time when you were a little kid, and that's how I felt at that time. So, I just wanted to. I had more to talk about in that regard last week, but and the moment's lost. I just wanted to share that those memories of the Joey Porter show because they were a lot of fun. And now I'll take some questions. So uh, thanks for uh, sticking with me this whole time and listening to me ramble on. And now I'll see if I can find some questions to answer because that's what I promised last week. Let's see what we have here. Here's one from Don Nolan. I don't know, but it's, it's a long one. So let's see what he has to say here. If sports world shuts down, why does the rest of the world keep working? They are privileged and titled ones with the means to deal with COVID better than normal everyday people. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I, I think it's a good point as far as if you're talking about the, uh, the professional sports leagues. Yeah, I mean, if, as long as they, if they decide not to have fans in the stands, which at this point, I think would make a lot of sense. I mean, we've been going through this since March and uh, a lot of states are, are seeing cases on the rise again. So it might be a, a good while before we ever are truly out of the woods with this virus. So if you have to have a whole season without fans, don't just don't have the fans. That's just, that's my opinion. You know, sports and, and or football and, and, and TV are the perfect marriage so, you know, if we, if we, I think it's a small price to pay if you love football, just uh, stay away from the stadiums for a year. No, don't show up outside the stadium and tailgate, which I'm sure they won't allow anyway. Just stay home, watch the games, and and who knows, maybe they'll maybe they'll win one for the the uh, index index finger on the other hand, right? I mean, maybe this is the year that happens, and if if it happens without fans in the stands, so be it. I think, you know, if, if there's a way to do it, do it. So I, I ho hopefully um, they can move forward in a safe manner and, and, and bring us some sports because I think we're all, we're all itching for sports to, to take our minds off of things. Let's see. Getting bent with Bo. How's it going, Tony? Uh, it's going great. Thank you for joining me, Getting Bent. I haven't seen you in a while. Good to, good to, uh, good to, good to see you. Let's see. Here's another one from Donald. Let's see. Here, here's one from Dill Willett. What does he have to say? So what do you think the chances are of Lynch making a move at maybe spot three or higher? To be honest, everything I've heard about the guy, the opinions on him aren't that great. So I think at this, at this point, I think uh, with his experience that he gained last year, I think Doc Hodges has a great opportunity to be the number three in 2020 maybe uh jt barrett i don't know i don't know much about him i know he, he had a pretty really good career at ohio state and he brings a whole new dimension to the quarterback room so who knows maybe 
maybe he he steps up this year and steals the number three. But as far as uh, Paxton Lynch, I, I mean, he's been around for a while. It seems like he was a big miss in the first round of the draft. So I, I don't, you know, other, as, as others have brought up uh, in, in the recent past, he, he does have a year under his belt learning the Steelers system. So that might benefit him. And, and, and obviously there is talent there or he, you know, he wouldn't have been a first round pick, but at this point, I, I think, uh, I think duck has the, uh, the inside track on, on the number three spot uh, in uh, on the roster for quarterback. So uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm proven wrong. I really haven't seen uh, Pax and Lynch do anything as a Steeler. So maybe he surprises us in the preseason. We'll, we'll have to find out. Let's see here. Who, what else we have? Let's see if we can find some more questions up top. I always miss those when I'm rambling on. Uh, let's see. Here's a new one. One from Mule Skinner. It's not really a question. It's a comment. Doc tosses too many rainbow passes. Well, I mean... Arm strength is not his, uh, well, strength. So um, for him, it's all about, I mean, I'm not a quarterback expert, but it's more about timing. And and, and we saw that exposed against the Bills last year, unfortunately, um, when he tried to throw those out patterns. Uh, those, uh, it's, you know, if you don't have a strong arm, it's hard to fit. It's hard to, to fit the ball in there, in there uh, on a rope. So, um, yeah. It's not, but then again, he was an undrafted free agent and he played at uh, what a division two school. So, you know, uh, those kind of guys um, tend to have weaker arms. It's just, just unfortunate, but um, it doesn't mean he can't be a, a serviceable number three. It doesn't mean he can't develop into a, a, a really good quarterback. You just don't know. I mean, you don't know with quarterbacks because they don't get a chance to play unless somebody gets hurt, right? So it's hard to see what their true development is uh, from year to year because we only hear about them in practice. We only see them in, in preseason. We don't see them over the course of a year going through the growing pains. And, and, and you know, how does Duck come back from a, a game like the one he had against the Bills? You know, obviously he didn't do, he didn't do that well the following week against the Jets because he was benched in, for, in favor of Mason Rudolph. And then, of course, Rudolph got hurt. And then Duck had to play uh, in the se season finale against the, the, the Ravens and, and didn't do a really good job that game either. So how does he bounce back from that? You know, that, that's the question with Mason Rudolph. How does he, how does he develop after his, all the experience he had in the second year in 2019? Does he, does he, does he use that to grow, to, 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 to improve, or does he stay the same or regress? Same with Devlin Hodges. Does he, does he uh, improve upon his uh, the experience that he had last year, or does he stay the same, or does he regress? Has the league figured both of these guys out already? You know, we don't know. Have they reached uh, the highest level that they possibly can, or is there another level there for one or both of them? That, that that's an interesting thing. And as a football fan, I'm always fascinated by by those kind of things. I mean, you just never know where where your next uh, great story is going to come from. Right. And there's certainly uh, from a, a, a team standpoint that they did take a chance on, on Mason Rudolph by, by drafting him in the third round. They, they claim to have a first round grade on him. So uh, I'm sure from, at least from an emotional standpoint, they'd like to see him, him succeed. So we'll see what 2020 has to say for both of those guys. Well, let's see here. Here's one from Steelers Pittsburgh. Matt Canada is supposed to improve our quarterback room. Well, I mean, it can't hurt. I mean, he has a uh, he has a wealth of experience. He has a great offensive mind. He's been successful, at least in college. He certainly was at Pitt when he was their coordinator and back in 2016. But yeah, I mean, having a, I think that that was one thing that was lacking last year because um, because uh, they didn't have uh, you know a real quarterbacks coach. They didn't have somebody that, that could really uh, give those guys the, the attention that they needed. So, yeah, I mean, just from the fact that they have a coach period is going to benefit them. At least it should. Right. I mean, cause when I mean, you can't rely on Ben to mentor these young guys when he has to, 
first of all, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure how crazy he is about that anyway. I don't know how, how crazy any veteran quarterback is about mentoring somebody who could possibly be his replacement, right? It's different for quarterbacks. I mean, uh, they do that at other positions, but those guys, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily mentoring them to be the starters or their replacements. They're mentoring them because, it, you know, even if you're not a starter at the other positions, you're going to play, right? Whereas a quarterback, it's hard not to look at that guy as, as somebody who could possibly replace you. So it's, it's hard. It's a lot to ask for your veteran quarterback coming off of elbow surgery, by the way, to mentor his backups when he's got to try to get ready to, you know, hopefully take his team on a, on a championship run, you know? So just simply having a quarterback in the room is, is going to be a big deal this year, hopefully anyway. So let's see what else we have here. Here's one from Andrew Wilbar. Which Steelers player will be hurt or help the most if the preseason is shortened even more? Well, that's a good question. Uh, Donald Nolan, if you're talking about help, I think, yeah, I think he, he mentioned Big Dan McCullers. And I think if he, if he, if he mentioned, uh, if you're talking about will it help him, I think it will because, you know, he's been around forever. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be harder to, to evaluate what these, these younger guys that they brought in. Uh, so, yeah, that could help him and keep, keep him on a roster for another year. As far as who it could hurt, I mean, any, any undrafted free agent, I mean, that, 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 I think that goes without saying, right? You know, uh, a guy like Paxton Lynch who, yeah, he's been around for a few years, but, you know, he's, he might not have the opportunity that he norm, would normally get to maybe prove to the coaches that, hey, look, you know, I have talent. I just haven't been in the right position yet, or I haven't had the right opportunity yet. So, so, you know, look what I can do. So, yeah, I think people like that, you know, lower drafted free agents, undrafted free agents, a guy like Derwin Gray, that that could, that could, that could hurt uh, him. A seventh round pick from last year, that that could possibly hurt him. And here's Mule Skinner. Tony, are you still sold on Juju as, as a number one? Well, I mean, Based on last year, no. But based on last year, you can't. I'm not sold on anything at this point because Ben wasn't there. You give him a, a whole season with Ben, maybe it's a different story, right? Um, and plus, he had he had his injury issue. So no, I'm not sold yet. But I'm confident that he could be a number one based on his first two years in the league and based on the fact that he had okay stats last year, despite all the struggles that he that he that he endured, despite. The, in the uh, deficiencies of the offense, he he uh, he drew a lot of double coverage. I've mentioned that several times. He drew a lot of double coverage last year, and he still managed what forty some, fifty some catches. I I have to co- constantly go back and look at stats. I can't remember them off the top of my head. But um, yeah, uh, I'm not sold on it. No, how could I be? He hasn't really proven himself to be a legit number one yet. Doesn't mean he can't be. Doesn't mean with Ben around. Uh, he can't be a, 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 a absolute beast as a number one receiver. I mean, how good would have Antonio Brown played last year with the quarterback play the way it was? You know, I mean, he might have had better stats, but I doubt he would have had. He would have looked like the Antonio Brown of old. You know, he wasn't going to get you a hundred some receptions last year. He probably wouldn't even have got you a thousand yards. You know, so it's hard to evaluate Juju based on last year. I'm I, I'm. I'm not sold, but I'm confident that if Ben's healthy all year, Juju's really going to show out in 2020. So I'll take one more and then I'll wrap things up at the, uh, we're, let's see. Good show, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Donna Nolan. I need that positive reinforcement. All right. Well, uh, that's pretty much all I have for today, I think. And, um, Again, I, I thank you all. It felt like a really good show. You know, hopefully I didn't uh, talk too fast. I'm working on that. But um, I, I appreciate you uh, you guys uh, participating, joining me. Uh, I appreciate the questions. And uh, I'll see you on Monday on uh, Steelers Q&A with Brian Anthony Davis at 5 o'clock. So uh, tune in for that and tune in again for Behind the Steel Curtain and Behind the Steel Curtain's YouTube page uh, for all your Steelers needs. And I will talk to you on Monday. Have a great rest of your weekend.